Father God, we thank you for today. And as we've had the opportunity to come and to sit and to open your word, what we really long for is to sense that you are here, that you would meet us in your word, that, Lord, having opened these things and understood them, our lives would be changed. And, Lord, tonight you speak very clearly to your disciples about what will set them apart from the world. And so, Lord, more than ever, as we watch the world around us, we need to be more like you. So we pray as we get into chapter 13 of John and as we get into, Lord, as we're heading down the, the slope here, Lord, to your betrayal, your rejection, your so-called trial, and then you're in the hands of the Romans. These things you foretold before they happened that we might know that this is according to God's determinate counsel, that he could send a savior to pay for the sins of the world so for those who would trust him, he can dismiss their case justly. So thank you, Lord, for the simple truth that God has sent a savior to provide a way for sinners. May our hearts be open to him this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come and that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, just as we learned he came down from the Father in John 1.1. 1, 1. He was with the Lord. Was, the word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh. Now he's departing to go back out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, there's quite a few things. And of course, now he jumps into the Last Supper and supper being ended. If you remember what has transpired, because John is assuming that as he's writing in 90 AD, most likely you've read either Matthew, Mark, or Luke, which have quite a few things in common in their accounts, a few minor detail changes as far as how many people were there or whatever, but that's just somebody giving you, if someone says one was there, the other says two, clearly one did the speaking, the other hung out, so the one focused on who talked, the other one focused on how many. Usually Matthew's the guy doing the accounting. But what has happened now as we're, Jesus has closed his public ministry, he has rebuked the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He has just absolutely ripped the mask off on them in the Temple Mount, crying out in Matthew 23, woe to you. And again, you hypocrites. And he laid bare many of their hypocrisies, their failures. And then, of course, left and the disciples pointed out the buildings. You will not see one stone upon another and all that. And he goes out and they have the Olivet Discourse. But as the week is progressing now, what has happened is you've read through, for example, Luke 24. Make sure I'm in the Luke 22. There it has entered now into Simon, into Judas Iscariot's heart that he will betray Jesus. Somewhere, some argue, perhaps Tuesday, we'll know when we get to heaven for sure, but somewhere in the midst of that Passion Week early, he has this desire to betray Christ. He goes to the chief priests. I believe Mark tells us when they heard he was willing to actually give them over for money, they were glad. They couldn't believe in their eyes the fortune, the luck, that one of his own would actually hand him over to them in a way that they could quietly just take him down and get rid of him. And so much for his dreams or so much for his proclamation that he's the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So these things are unfolding during that week. And where we get to now is, if you remember when Jesus was getting getting things ready for the, the disciples said, where should we prepare for the Passover? And he took, we learned Peter and John and he sent again, Luke's gospel tells us he sent Peter and John. And he said, when you go into the city, there you will meet a, a man doing what? Carrying a pitcher of water. Pitcher of water. <laughs> you might, you're thinking like, well, that's, you know, that's like saying you might meet someone at Wawa putting gas in their tank, right? I mean, you know, like, uh, well, you need to know something. Who normally carries pitchers of water? Women. Women. So here they go in and they see this man carrying the pitcher of water. They follow him. And when they get to the house, they say, say to the master of the house that the master need, or the owner of the house, the master needs your upper room work and they prepare for the Passover. And of course, Peter and John find that individual, go buy the things they need, prepare the room. And then later Jesus shows up with the rest of the disciples. Now you might ask yourself, why all the, like all the secrecy? That's our clue. Judas has already had his discussion with the chief priest that he's going to betray him. And that's why Jesus sends him in to meet someone carrying a pitcher of water so that the location cannot be disclosed until Jesus wants it to be known to be arrested. That's what's going on. 
So they've gone, they've prepared, they've set up, they've come in, they've had the Last Supper, they've eaten. He's after the Supper. Many argue, again, when they try to do a harmony of the Gospels, where they line them up in what they think is the correct order. Many feel they've had the Supper. He's actually done the Last Supper. We won't know until we get to heaven for sure. But there's, those things are already having happened now in the upper room. Luke lets us know around this time in chapter 22, as that stuff is all settled down, the apostles or the disciples settle into a good old-fashioned debate of which one of them should be the greatest. Now, John, supper being ended, John knows you've read about that. The devil how now having Balo to cast or throw, like to cast on an impulse, throw something in. The devil having now cast into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray. The idea is to give over, to betray him. Jesus knowing, there's our word Ido, seeing or knowing, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. How many got that was clear? Just as he's been telling him. That he was come from God, that's chapter one, went to God, that'll be our last chapter. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, the outer cloak, outer mantle, sword and tunic, took a towel and girded himself, wrapped it around his waist. And after that, he poureth, same word, balo, to cast, he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wash them with the towel wherewith he was girded. What is he doing? Teaching. Lou's his teaching and Lou's right. But what is he also doing? State the obvious. Serving. Washing feet, which is serving. It is according to historians, and we have to wait till heaven to find out for sure, but when you were brought in as a servant or you were, you know, for example, in Israel, you got in debt, you sold yourself for six years, you basically earned money, you get out of your debt or whatever. Uh, one of the early jobs of the lowliest in the household, you know, pecking order for servants, one of the early jobs you would get is washing feet. Because, no offense, think about, you know, Israel, dusty streets, lots of livestock and other things, trash in the streets. You know, you, <laughs> your guests come in, you're like, oh, cut through the stables, didn't you? I mean, you know, and now you've got to wash them. So here we are, upper room, last supper, and their feet still aren't washed. Why? Well, there's no servant, apparently. And? Come on, think it through. None of the rest of them, I, I'm like, I've seen Peter's feet, man. I am not touching Peter's feet. So they looked around, and they're all like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not even like, well, Lord, we'll get your feet. Nobody moves. They don't wash anybody's feet. So Jesus gets up after the supper where they've had this debate about which one of them is going to be the greatest. Starts, takes off his mantle, puts that down, the shawl kind of thing to us. Kind of perhaps took off even his outer sort of tunic. He's now down in kind of a, a wrap. And he puts the towel around his waist and he takes a bowl and he starts pouring water in. And I wonder who it dawned on first. Like, oh no, the Lord's going to wash our feet and none of us washed it. You know, and so now the guilt comes in of like, oh man, you know. So he uh, goes around. And he's washing their feet which is a job of a slave. And Judas has already covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver to sell Jesus to them, which, by the way, 30 pieces of silver is the price of a slave. So Jesus begins to go around the table. And if you're thinking, well, you know, if you think of the Leonardo da Vinci thing, don't, anyway, stay with him, the Da Vinci Code and all that's a mess. It's wrong. But, you know, Leonardo is thinking from a Western mentality of sort of the long table and the chairs and everybody hanging out in the goblets. In the East, you roll up your, your outer cloak, your bed, or whatever you may have, or pillows. You put it under your left arm. You lay with your feet out behind you. So you're in kind of like a, a sort of a semi-horseshoe type shape. And you've got basically people going around the table. They all lean in. And then the dishes are in the middle. And you take and keep eating and double dip and keep eating and that's just the way they do it oh yeah that's why they were upset when he ate with tax collectors and prosperous because you keep you know, going back and forth and you're becoming one with them get the idea okay so they're all laying around with their feet so your feet are out behind you so it's really not that hard to go around and get people's feet it's not like now where you got to get under a table and crawl around them so consider it from an eastern point of view so he starts going around washing their feet it seems, as we look at this, he gets to Peter, and it seems he's been at this for a while. And as we get through our text, I think hopefully as you look at it, it'll sort of be its own proof in that we know that John is on his right side. How do we know that? Because he leans back on his chest. That's a good clue. 
especially if you're all reclining with your legs out and you're on your side, he's got to be in front of him to the right so he can lean back and say, who is it? But then also during this meal, he's going to give a special token or a special gift, and usually the host will put it in the mouth of the special guest, which means there's a high probability Judas is next to him on the left. So the two seats of honor with peers, one is John, the other is Judas. That's interesting. And Peter is beckoning over to John. And so he, if Jesus is here, you know, here's John, here's Jesus, here's Judas. We work our way around. Peter's able to get line of sight on him somehow. He's somewhere in here. Be harder if he's back here. So he's got to be more around the other side of the U away from John where you can look at him and start going like, what's going on? So I want to lay the room out for you. And when we get to Israel, should God ever bless you to be able to go there? Should we actually ever get back there with the way the borders are going? But if we get back there, we go into what they think is, or at least a sample of an upper room. And sometimes we'll actually let make, it's very busy, very crowded, but we'll lay people around and we'll actually kind of reenact that. And it's pretty great to see they'll be in a room like, wow, this is not the room, but this is what that room might've looked like. And it's pretty powerful to think of how that went down. Now, if you have say 12 friends, you could do this at home. Just, you know, get some towels out, lay them around, kind of get around and then put, you know, put who's supposed to be John and somebody play Jesus, you know, and then put Judas there and choose wisely because people have feelings. And then, uh, you know, put them all in order and then everybody roll up a beach towel, put it under your left arm, put out some chips and nachos or whatever, and then start, just start thinking of how this room gets shocking information. They're all kind of huddled around and, and their world is going sideways suddenly. So that's our backdrop. So he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wash them with the towel wherewith he was girded, like a common slave. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, so working his way around. Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? The word washer is nipto, to wash a part of you. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now. But thou shalt know hereafter. And that's kind of standard operating procedure with Pete. He kind of gets it a little later. Peter, you don't get it right now, but you'll, you'll figure it out later. Peter, Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. Again, nip to it, to wash a part of it. Never wash my feet. Now, Peter's a passionate guy because in the Greek, it's actually ume eis ho eon. You shall, you shall know not ever forever, basically, no not for the ages wash my feet. Kind of like, a, oh, not even forever wash my feet. Not just no, this is no with four words. She'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, <laughs> If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Then you're not part of us. No share. Well, Simon Peter saith unto him, Well, then, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Well, then give it to me. Give me the whole thing, Lord. And Jesus saith unto him, He that is, now this is a different word, luo, to wash the body. For example, when someone would die, they would luo, wash the body, wrap it and prepare it and bury it. So he, that is Lua, washed completely, fully cleansed or washed over, needeth not save to nipto, just a little part of the body, kind of clean up, so to speak, his feet, but is clean, every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. So the picture is this, you know, you have a shower, you get all cleaned up, and then you walk around bare feet, your feet are nasty, you come in, you clean them. So even though you're generally clean, part of you has gotten defiled and needs to be made right. Everybody following that line of thought here? So Peter, you don't need your head and your hands and everything else because of Peter's faith, and it will grow with time, and we'll see it as we work our way through. But because of Peter's faith, Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. Who else can we go? You are the son of God. You are the Christ, God's Messiah. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Because Peter's faith has been placed in Christ, and again, these things are developing, they're learning. Because of that, he's been cleansed, and he will be cleansed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're cleansed. But there's an interesting metaphor here of that, but yet in the course of being in this world, we come in course in contact with defilement. One of our secretaries, one of our gals on staff here, she often will sit and counsel with women and she'll take this text to talk about when you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. The things we've done before we met Jesus are under the blood of Christ. However, as we live in this fleshly body with fleshly desires, with fleshly thoughts and things that come across us all the time in the world around us, there are times we don't do what we should do. How many have ever experienced that? The rest of you are lying. That's why James or John said, look, if, if we say we have no sin, we lie. The truth isn't in us. Even though in Christ, our sins are forgiven. But if we confess our sins and not just, well, sorry for that thing I did. Well, that's vague. 
Sorry for, you know, whatever, lusting after my neighbor's wife. Sorry for wanting to see physical harm come to my boss. Sorry for whatever it may be, right? I mean, Lord, th these things are whether they're in our hearts or actually in our physical actions to be repentance with God. If, you're, if you don't hide it, you, you get honest with God, you'll find it's a lot easier to get away from it. Real repentance, real confession. So there are things that we go through and we get to file. I mean, you, you can't hardly turn on the tube or anything else or you know, search for things or whatever it may be without, or now, I mean, have you seen the new gig is they text garbage to you by phone? Like, some, like that's a really weird link. We're just going to block that. I mean, garbage is everywhere. And just in the course of living and moving and having your being in this world, suddenly you find yourself defiled or worse. You find yourself getting a thought and rather than putting it out of your head, you actually give it a few cycles in the brain of like, oh, yeah, ooh, what am I doing here? Have you been there? You were cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But when we fail, you know what? You get up like, Lord, I'm truly sorry. I'm sorry, and you'd be specific. This is what I've done. I ask for your forgiveness. You confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He never called you to be perfect. He called you to be faithful. That's important. It's a big difference. A lot of people out there, well, I've got to be perfect. <laughs> That's going to be a real disappointment. But he's called you to be faithful. God's people make mistakes all the time. I don't think I have to explain this to you. Anybody here married? You get it. So Peter here, he's come to wash him. Jesus has come to cleanse them, to wash them. And he's going around. And, you know, how many of you have ever had a coworker really try to give you the business? I mean, like the business. You know, just anybody? No? None of you? Neighbor? Family member? I'll stop there before you have to disclose too much. How about someone already has 30 pieces of silver in his pocket? You are sinless. And he's just waiting for the right chance to dime you out to the Sanhedrin so they can put you to death. And you're washing his feet. It doesn't say he washed 11 feet. It doesn't say he washed everybody and then got tired by the time he got to Judas went, oh, my back, and put everything down. He washed all of their feet, including the one who betrayed him. And he knew, he knew from the beginning. Mark, in chapter 6, we were told by John, for he knew who would betray him. He's known this for chapters to us. And he washed his feet. And he sat him, as far as we can tell, in a place of honor. Not the primary, but the secondary. Remember when James and John's mama came to Jesus and said, can my sons have a little favor? When you come into your eternal realm and throne, can they sit on your right hand? Can they have eternal shotgun, right and left hand? He said, that's not for me to give. And yet you're washing this guy's feet, knowing he's going to leave and go betray you. If you have someone that's in your life that's been very hard to love, or perhaps even just be around, serve, or you see them and your brain is just, you know, gone. You're like, mm, you can feel everything getting tight. If there's somebody who's got that kind of power over your peace with God or your joy or even just your hate, it's something you need to bring to God. It's God allowing it to show in your heart where you're coming from. There are times I've been through this, I'm sure you have too, where you're just, just, just hearing a name and you're like, mm, you know, and, and you can't control what they're going to do. That's, it's, it says in the word, as much as lieth within you, be at peace with all men. You can't be responsible for what they do, but you can be responsible for what you do. And maybe somebody has really hurt you or burned you. Maybe it's from your past, you grew up as a kid or whatever, but, you know, maybe they're dead and gone, but you can still forgive them and be free of that bitterness and that, that's got you so gripped. Because Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed and have done nothing wrong. So it talks about in Hebrews, he has been tempted in every manner as we have yet without sin. You got something that's really stuck in your crawl with somebody else and you know it's a bad testimony because you just, you just got nothing but venom for him and, you, and you're stuck. You know what? He'll get you unstuck from that if you ask him. If he can wash Judas' feet, then he can give us the grace to deal with people who are really giving us a run for our money that we'd like to actually see, you know, come to harm or whatever it may be that's going through your brain. That might be an ex-spouse. What I'm doing now, Peter, as usual, you don't know, but you know hereafter. So Peter said, well, then right on, Lord, you shall, you know, give me my hands and my feet and the whole thing, because I want to have a part with you, a share with him in his kingdom. So Jesus saith to him, verse 10, he that washeth, luo, complete body wash, needeth not but to wash, nipto, to cleanse from the defilement he's been involved in his feet, but is clean. And every wit, and you are clean, and here's the first bomb he drops on him, but not all. And nobody goes, what did he say? What was that? He was near Peter when he said that. Not all. For Jesus knew who should betray him. He's known this again for chapters to us. 
Therefore, saith he, ye are not all clean. Now, was it Judas's feet that weren't clean? No, they'd been washed. So what is he talking about? It's heart. You put your life and your faith in Christ, he'll clean your heart. Once in a while, you've got to get a little touch up, but it'll change your heart. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Uh, you washed our feet? He's not talking about the feet. In fact, they look like a bunch of blank stares. You think it's bad when I ask you questions and I start looking at you and you're like, oh, I hope he doesn't call me. You know, funerals, we have a time of sharing and, you know, people are always afraid to get up and come talk. And so somebody eventually will lead off, we'll keep going. And then when people get really quiet, I tease them saying, don't make us call names. And you can see them all go like, what kind of church is this? <laughs> you gotta, you know, get somebody to do it. Do you know what I've done to you? I think you got a bunch of blank stares. The word is gonna go, do you actually understand what I've done to you? Blank stares. You call me master and Lord, and ye say well, for so am I. Note that. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed, nipto, to wash part, washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, which is the best way, by the way, to teach. And that word example is hupodigma, which is to show, to forewarn an example or a pattern. I have given you a forewarning, a pattern, or something that you should follow. I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Well, past Chris, past Chris. Yes. Well, then why don't we have a good old fashioned foot washing? Well, it's a nice thing to do. But you might say, well, I've been coming to this church for two decades. They've never done a foot washing. You know, you're right. I don't think we, well, we might have had a wedding where somebody washed his bride's feet, which is cool. But why don't we do it? Well, because when the early church, now churches have added quite a few of their own things, traditions, whatever, behaviors, patterns, whatever, rites. But from a biblical point of view, the church would own something as a standard practice or a thing that should be followed if, number one, Jesus taught about it. Number two, the book of Acts showed it. Number three, it's confirmed in the epistles. So if it's given to us by Jesus, given to us again in the book of Acts, confirmed by the epistles, that's something that the church is obligated, ought to, to be faithful to the message of Christ to do. So, did Jesus tell us we ought to be baptized? Yep. Did the book of Acts have baptism? Yep. Do we have baptism mentioned throughout in the epistles, different places, about washing away? Yep. So guess what? If you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you ought to, when you get an opportunity, be baptized to make a public proclamation of what has happened privately in your heart, that you have put your trust in Jesus Christ and through him you have died to the old man through his death and resurrection. You've been raised to a new life in Christ. Sin no longer rules and dominates your life. You now have the Holy Spirit which has given you now the power to be able to say no if you'll walk in the spirit to temptation and sin. You have a new life. So baptism is something you ought to do. And I've met people like, well, I've never had a chance. Well, when you get a chance, do it. Well, if I don't get baptized, will it keep me out of heaven? Ask the thief on the cross when you get there. Because he wasn't baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. And we can prove that in 1 Corinthians where Paul said, Christ hasn't sent me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. If baptism saved you, Paul would have gone through the entire European Roman world just grabbing people and dunking them. Just anywhere you can find one, just dunking them. Dunk them. Yeah, yes. Yeah, just dunking them everywhere. It doesn't save you. It's an outward sign of an inward reality that you put your faith in Christ and through his death and resurrection, you've died with him to eternal life, risen again a new creature in Christ. That's the truth. Now, second thing, communion. Did Jesus do it? Yes. Yeah, he gave it to us. Do we see it in the book of Acts? Yes. Yeah, we hear about it there. Do we see it in the epistles? Well, 1 Corinthians 11, he rebukes them for doing it poorly. Yes. So that's an established order that we will observe here. We, COVID's been a little hard to take communion. We've been doing CRTs, the communion's ready to take, which really are not as good as a regular communion, but we do it here and there. And people have been pretty concerned with COVID, so we've been doing it less. But usually it's about every six to eight weeks when things were, the word we all hate now, normal. Foot washing, Jesus did it for the disciples. No mention of in the book of Acts, even when Paul travels, goes to Caesarea, sees Philip, the evangelist, one of the original deacons, stays in his home, no mention of foot washing. Sees Manasin, one of those early disciples, stays with him, no mention of foot washing. The only thing we hear about in the epistles is Timothy being instructed by Paul when considering to bring a woman into the order of widows where the church would provide for them because they're destitute, many of them without a spouse and without children. They're destitute. They have no, there is no social security. 
And one of the requirements is if she's lodged strangers, if she's washed people's feet, in other words, shown herself a servant. So we have it in the Gospels, and we have one mention in the case of widows and their behavior, their personal behavior and integrity, mentioned from Paul to Timothy to be wise in his choice, nothing in the book of Acts. Therefore, while it's a nice thing to do with the church, it's not something the church in general considers an essential, mandatory. Does that make sense? If not, well, sorry, I wasted four minutes of your time, but... For those who are digging in, I thought you know that. That's how they had the criteria to establish something as church practice. If they saw it from Christ in the epistles and in the book of Acts, then they said, okay, so you have baptism, you have communion. Water baptism, by the way. Foot washing not mentioned completely. So, do you know what I've done for you? Not really. I have done for you, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And boy, is that the best way to teach. Parents, if you don't want your kids yelling at each other, why do you yell at them? In our house, the rule is you're not allowed to yell unless something's on fire or someone's bleeding. So when someone is bleeding, they take full advantage of it. We had one time when a light bulb caught a shade of a lamp on fire and they went nuts. They took advantage of that. But generally, and people think, oh, you're in 11 kids. We're down to like five now, but you're in 11 kids, that must be crazy. No, our house was actually pretty quiet. And back when we had, we've never had all 11 at one time in the house. One left, got married, just as the other got born. So it's always been 10. But we'd have like, sometimes they bring three to four friends or four, I don't know, sometimes we have like 18 kids in our house after a Sunday, because they all decided to come over to our house, and you wouldn't hear a thing. There's them doing Legos, some out back, it was quiet. We don't yell at our kids. I don't yell at my wife. She doesn't yell at me. That's just, that's, how's that showing honor to one another? And as we get through here a few more verses, how's that showing love one to another? You parents teach more than you know by what you do. They catch everything. I mean, if you don't, you know, you don't want them lying, then are you lying? You don't want them, you know, treating people rudely in many ways? Or, I mean, you don't want them cursing? Do you curse? I mean, it's, it's really not very hard. If you'll let Christ live through you and let him deal with your flesh, and yes, he'll help you if you've got a mouth or help you if you've got anger issues or whatever it is. If you'll let him do that in you, you'd be surprised the impacts it'll have on your kids. Same thing with, and this is marriage. They're learning from you, good or bad, what marriage looks like. Sadly, when you have homes where they had a lot, and divorce is on the rise, and when you see people going through that, a lot of times you hear them say, I don't ever want to get married. What's that testimony? I don't ever want to be precious to someone who loves me in spite of my faults and is committed to this life with me and the Lord. And, you know, we'll hopefully one day be able to grow old together and watch our kids grow up and graduate and get their own, you know, spouses and have their own kids and get to figure out what they thought we had wrong for themselves. There's so much. How about ministry? Too many people want to be served. People want to be America's pastor. I'm just trying to be faithful to be a pastor to this room that people come three times on Sunday. I could care less if people know who we are. What I care is they know who Jesus is. Amen. What kind of example is set there? It's amazing. And work among your coworkers, unsaved and saved. Wherever you are, if it's known you believe in Christ, you have one of two possible outcomes. You're either actually convicting and challenging to them by how you live and how you serve other people, or you're giving them probable cause or due justification for why they will never go to a church. You're preaching all the time, whether you know it or not. That's true. And if you got saved by watching some other people, they preached to you by how they were different. And sadly, what's happened is the church has tried to become more worldly to win the world, but all they've done is become more worldly and less salt, less light, and the world's like, we already have that. What do we need them for? Plus, they want money from us. Really? Do you know what I've done to you? Or what I've done for you or to you? No. You call me master, you call me Lord, you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, I have served you. You ought also to wash one another's feet. Meanwhile, none of them had, and they were all arguing who's the greatest. For I have given you an example, a pattern to follow, that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. There's been quite a few people in the history of the church that have felt themselves greater than the Lord. Beware the term Christian celebrities. It doesn't really make sense to me. Christian celebrities. That's a problem. And it seems 
I don't know, perhaps you've seen differently, but so, you know, for whether it's Jim and Tammy or even, sadly, Bob Coy down in Fort Lauderdale, these people who became, you know, very well known and everything else, when Bob Coy fell, his fall at Fort Calvary Fort Lauderdale was on the front page of the UK Daily Mail. How's that for making a headline? The servant is not greater than his Lord. Watch out for it if you think suddenly you've got it together. We're just here to serve. He's not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. This is really easy for people to lose if they're trying to feed an ego, and it's very sad to see. Here's a key, verse 17. If you know these things, if Jesus came to serve us, and we've asked him to forgive our sins, and he's filled us with the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, then it shouldn't be a problem to serve other people because you've been given the Spirit of God demonstrated to us through the ministry of Christ. Shouldn't be a problem to serve other people. And that doesn't mean you're in ministry. You could be in public service, you can be in a company, or whatever it may be, you're a school teacher, and you can still be a servant. And man, it's amazing how when you actually don't care, you just go serve whatever, like, well, don't do that, that's for, you know, that's for the custodial crew. Well, I help make the mess. My wife used to get rebuked by a principal in California for doing things that was for the custodial crew, as a teacher. Apparently, somebody else was convicted. <laughs> if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I speak not to you all. Some of you are amazing servants. We have a lot of good people who serve constantly in this church. We have been so blessed. I speak not of you all. For I know, I do, I see whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that, what was that? The scripture may be fulfilled. We got a prophecy. He that, hath eat, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Of course, you know what that means, right? That means we've got to go to 2 Samuel 15. 2 Samuel 15. What does that mean? How many have heard of um, King Saul? Good, we're not talking about him. How many have heard of um, King David? Good, all right, just make sure. It's Wednesday night, just trying to keep you on your toes. David has a son, Absalom. Absalom's gone through a few things. He decides in chapter 15 to schmooze the people, and I'm gonna cliff note this or spark note it for you more advanced students. We're just gonna roll through here. And as he does it, he gathers some 200 people to go with him out to Hebron, where he claimed he was gonna pay a vow, but instead he suddenly declares himself to be king in rebellion against David, his father. He goes out there, he does this thing, and in verse 12, we learn that Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's chief counselor. Sends him from his city. So they get there and they suddenly declare that Absalom is king. He's reigning in Hebron. The nation is with him. There's a revolt and David's days are numbered. David hears about it in Jerusalem, realizes what's coming. They're marching on Jerusalem rather than make the city go through siege and everything else. And he's also smart enough to know the best place to be is not in a contained environment when you're under attack. He leaves. He leaves. His mighty men go with him. They start fleeing. They start leaving. He leaves 10 concubines behind to oversee the house within the fortress there in Jebusite Fortress, the city of David. They head out. They go over the Mount of Olives. They're making their way down to head towards the Jordan River and get away in the valley. That's what's happening. As he's on his way, a lot of things happen, but one of his good friends, Hushai, comes to him, and David says, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I'm going with you. He said, no, because he heard Ahithophel was among Absalom's rebellion. And so he prayed, God, could just basically confound the council of Ahithophel. He knew that's a problem. This guy is a brilliant strategist. Confound him. So he says to Hushai, listen, you're more effective to me if you go back, kiss up to Absalom, pretend you're one of his advisors, and if you can, countermand the, the advice of Ahithophel. So he goes back. He goes to Absalom. What are you doing here? Well, hey, I go where the power is. Top, typical politician. You're in charge now, and so I'm with you. And so they let him stay, and they had their, basically their war council. And they said to Ahithophel, Give counsel we, what we ought to do. And the first thing that he said was, set a tent on top of your father's palace. Take the 10 concubines and go in and defile them intimately. It's the same roof from which David saw Bathsheba. Took her to be his own, had committed adultery with her, figured out she's pregnant, had, his, had her husband killed by so-called, you know, friendly fire military action. Not only he, but several others. Buried the whole thing, pretended it didn't exist until Nathan the prophet came and confronted him. 
It's the same place David fell in the sin that brought some of this judgment against him. Now a tent is set up and Absalom goes in and has his way with these 10 women. And the reason Ahithophel told him to do that is because once he does that, there is no going back. No way is a father going to let that one off the hook because to go into the king's wives or secondary wives is to make the proclamation, you're the king now. So then they said, okay, now what? And Ahithophel said, let me take 12,000 men We'll go out quickly, we'll find David, we'll only kill David, we'll wipe them out, we'll bring the rest of them back, the kingdom is yours, that's what we should do. Brilliant. Well, they decide to ask Hushai, who was sent there to countermand Ahithophel's council, what do you think? And Hushai diplomatically said, well, the counsel Ahithophel gives is not good at this time because what happens if these guys get out there, come after David and his mighty men, who, by the way, built a kingdom, subdued all their enemies around them, is shut out every battle, shut out. David won, other team zero. What happens in trying to take them down? They actually rally and start beating your guys and everybody panics because they know your father's a mighty man of war. His guys are trained killers and they're all a little put out right now with what you're doing. The nation will panic. They'll throw you over the, you know, over the wall as soon as they can just to be done with this thing and you're, you're finished. So here's what you do. You gather from Beersheba all the way up to north to Dan. You get the whole nation behind you. You amass a massive army. You march in front of them. Ego stroke. You march in front of them. You guys, you'll find them. You overwhelm them. You take them all out. No retribution than any David's guys. And boom, you're made king. And everybody went, oh, that's a great plan. Absalom's, you know, seeing himself in front of the whole nation and taking David down in his bitterness against them. And so they went with that plan. When Ahithophel knew they went with that plan, he went home, put everything in order, and hung himself. Why? Because he knew it would fail, and it did. But I'm not going to tell you the rest, because if you've never read it, so go read it. I'm just giving you cliff notes. Plot twists, warning. But David, writing about this later, wrote Psalm 41. And that's what we actually had to go look at, but I wanted to give you the background. Psalm 41. Psalm of David. A psalm written about these things. I think it's 41. My brain may be failing. I want Psalm. Yeah, 41.9. Psalm 41. He said, an evil disease say they cleaveth fast unto him. Now he that lieth shall not rise up anymore. The idea is that people are saying, all that whisper again, well, look at verse seven. All that hate me whisper together against me is under a coup. Against me they devise my hurt and evil disease. In other words, payback cleaves fast unto him. Now he that lieth shall rise no more. Verse nine, yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, his most trusted advisor, which did eat the bread of my table, hath lifted up his heel against me in betrayal. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me and raise me up that I may requite or repay them. God did. So back to our text. So now in quoting Psalm 41, 9, he's saying, there is one sitting at the table who is betraying me and burning me as badly as Ahithophel did to David. Now you might be saying, well, why did Ahithophel flip to the other side? Because he had a son named Eliam who had a daughter named Bathsheba. That was his granddaughter, basically. And he was not okay with what David did. And he got his chance to pay him back. And that's why I said, take his 10 concubines, go on the roof and defile them. He paid him back tenfold. Didn't work out long term for him, but at least he got a little pound of flesh in the whole thing. It's the problem with the revenge. It doesn't always go the way you think. So I speak not of you all, verse 18, for I know who I have chosen. But the scripture that it may be fulfilled, what David went through would be a foreshadowing of the Messiah. He that eateth bread with me, that hour at that table, hath lifted up his heel against me in betrayal and rebellion. Why is he doing this? Verse 19. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am. I'm warning you so you don't lose your marbles here. Verily, that's sort of a modern thought. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. When you witness, you're not presenting you as a savior. You're presenting Jesus as a savior. They don't want to hear about it. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting his offer of eternal life. Don't personalize it. Just let down the net. Some fish will swim in, some fish will go by, and that's not your problem. Just let down the net. 
He that receiveth me, or believe, no, let's get back to it. Verily I say unto you, he that receiveth, whomsoever I send, receiveth me. He that receiveth me, receiveth him, the Father that sent me. So when Jesus had said thus, again in this upper room, he was terasso in the Greek, stirred or agitated like that water in chapter 5. He was troubled in spirit. And he testified, because again, lots of blank faces around the table. Verily, verily, I say unto you, in case you didn't get the psalm, one of you shall betray me. Now the room erupts. The disciples looked on one another, doubting of whom he spake, which is really interesting. Because you think they would have all gone, Judas? Nope. They didn't know. You come to the conviction he is the son of God. You walk away from your really schmoozy tax collector job. Yeah, everybody hates you, but the money's good. You leave your fishing boats and whatever else you were doing. Three and a half years. And one of you are going to betray him? Three and a half years through thick and thin with these guys. Sent out to raise the dead, heal the sick, do all these other things, feed the poor. One of us is going to betray him. By the way, that means one of those who did go out and heal the sick and feed the poor and all the other things did all those things and still betrayed him. That's a warning. Well, the disciples looked around at one another, doubting of whom they speak. You know, the eyes are shooting back and forth. They're all like, what? So verse 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, new information in the upper room, thanks to John, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. And who to most degree it is? The author, John. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him, which means in our half circle, John, leaning on Jesus' chest, yeah, clearly to the right. Judas, able to get a sop, we'll see in a minute, has to be to the left if he put it in his mouth, which means Pete's on the far end, and the farther away you are from the host, the less esteemed you are. <laughs> Poor Peter. You know, for all we know, he's the last guy on the horn, you know, on the other side. But Peter... Beckoning to him, interesting word, it means to, to nuot, it's to nod or to beckon or to signal someone sort of with your head. And remember, they fish together, they're all about it, like, you know, you know, they got all their little symbols down. Peter beckoned him, like, who? And I don't think he went, who is? I don't think it was that of, you know, that, you know, so, you know, I think it was more just, he beckoned to him, John, get on the job, man. Who is it that he's speaking of? Verse 23, so he then, lying on Jesus' the word is stethos. Doctors have a tool to listen to it called a stethoscope, chest. He, lying back on the Jesus' kind of shoulder props or whatever, said, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give, that's bapto to dip or immerse. He it is that I shall immerse a piece of bread, which they would call sop. One of the dishes, you take it, you immerse it. And it's told by some historians that they would actually take it and actually put it to the mouth or put it in the mouth of the guest of honor. Now, guys, you understand this, right? You're out, you're having steak. It's a good one. It's like, oh, it's a good one. Your wife's having crab cakes and she goes, wow, these crab cakes are great. Try them. And it's like, mm, fork's right here, right? Anybody? Am I, the, am, am I the only one? Can I go home tonight? Can I say this? And you're grooving on the steak and you're like, oh, I don't want crab cake in my mouth. I'm enjoying the steak. You know, and, and you, you know, I wonder if that was the same with Eve. Try this. You know. Now, if you go with us to Israel, our guide, Ido, wonderful guy, very Middle East, he, uh, he will stop at a little street vendor, breads, other things, dates, whatever, and he'll just quick buy a few. And then as he's going along talking to everybody, he just starts, he doesn't ask you if you want a piece. He just, like, you know, and next year, like, do you want some? You're like, no. You know, and, and everybody just, they realize, like, so then people start staying away from him. They see him near the street vendor because they're not sure if they like it. They watch the first few people and they're like, wow, wow. Then they come up and they get theirs. So this is kind of Middle Eastern here. He to whom I shall give the saw when I have dipped it. When he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. Some argue literally put it to his mouth. You're supposed to receive it as the honored guest. We'll find out in heaven. The son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, you wonder which one? Judas or Satan? That that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. Had they, I don't think he would have made it out alive, personally. I mean, Peter at least probably got both ears off. 
For some of them thought because Judas had the bag, the money bag that is, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast. In other words, go do something, go get something. Or that he should give something to the poor. They had no idea. They just thought he was being dispatched on an errand. He then, having received the sop, an act of friendship, went out immediately, or went immediately out, and it was dark due to an act of betrayal. Guest of honor, feet were washed, many opportunities to turn from the course, given a sop, and could have stayed. God gave him opportunities. He went out and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. It will be through his death and through his resurrection, which has changed how we count time on our calendars, B.C., A.D. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Why? Because God so loved the world. The what? He gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believes in him would not perish, but shall receive eternal life. Should not. It's the truth of the gospel. He gave his son for you and for me. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself. Fast forward to chapter 17. It's one of the few times we ever hear Jesus say, I want something. And he says, Father, I will that those you, be, get, you have given me shall behold me in my glory, which I have had with you from the beginning. One time, I can't wait till my people actually see me where I came from at the right hand of the Father. God shall be glorified in him and shall glorify him in himself. We've seen nothing yet. And shall straightway glorify him. That empty tomb was a very important statement. Little children, why is he saying that? Because they're really messed up right now. What? Who? What? Little children, yet a little while I am with you, and ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews a few chapters ago, like chapter 7 and 8, as I said unto the Jews, whither I go... Ye cannot, that's udunama, you have no power to come. So now I say it to you. Well, that's interesting. And then he goes into verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, qualifies it, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. We're going to come back to that, because Peter totally missed it. Verse 36. Peter said unto him, Lord, where are you going? He's two verses back. Missed the whole thing about loving each other. Proves it in the garden by cutting someone's ear off. Where are you going? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. Again, udunamai, no power. But here, unlike the Jews, some hope. But thou shalt follow me afterward. You know, it's more true than we realize because Peter was crucified upside down, according to historians, because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified right side up like his Lord. So he's not only going to die, he's going to die according to history by crucifixion, just as Jesus did. And having died through crucifixion, he will be with him in the Father's house. So as I said, whither I go now, you cannot follow me, but you shall follow me afterward. But let's come back to the real thing. Verse 34, we need to know. A new commandment have I given unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Think of how Jesus has loved you from the moment he convicted you, called him to himself, forgave your sin, filled your heart, and even when you make mistakes now, he does not use guilt. He does not use manipulation. He does not use shame. So we shouldn't either. When we sin and we know we're out of order with God, he brings conviction. Conviction is our relationship is right now stressed or whatever because you have stepped out. You need to return that we might be right with each other. God doesn't move. He's on his throne. We moved. We deviated. We wandered. And so the conviction is to come back and be in a place where God can again be in fellowship with us and we can sense his presence and his blessing. You know, the old, you know, I know now cars all have like dials and buttons or whatever, but when I was a kid, you had a little knob on the side like the old Mustang 2s and everything. Push it in. You go PRNDL. You're right? You just, boop, 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 boop. rear lights come on, then you drop in the drive, and boom, you're in drive. When we get into sin, we start walking rebellion. You know, when we start kind of slipping, it's like our walk with God slides into neutral. We're no longer really under momentum. We're just kind of now cruising on what we've done before. But when we really get messed up in sin, it's like we get slammed in part. Bang! Teeth in the windshield. And he convicts us. Because God doesn't, he doesn't want our walk with him being jammed in park or put on a shelf. He wants fellowship with us. So if we say we have fellowship with God, but we walk in darkness, again, John said to us the same author, then we're lying. 
But again, if we confess our sins, he's faithful just to forgive us our sins and to help us to walk in the light. Because honestly, people, it's never been closer. And I know that's a cliche, but it has literally never been closer for the return of Christ for his church. And it's getting really, really weird and confused out there. To where, how do you recover from some of the things you're doing now? Good time to be ready. Well, you ever wonder why churches split, have so many arguments, theological debates, people go away wounded, burnt, and all that? Because one thing Satan wants to try to make sure is the church doesn't love one another. Because we're told our badge, our hallmark should be, you come into a place and you can say, well, those people love Jesus and those people love one another. If we can't stop them from loving Jesus, well, then the next best thing you do is keep them from loving one another. So people come in and go, that's what it means to know Christ. What about this? I'm out of here. Which is why the body of Christ comes under attack so much. Because it's a hallmark that we've been with Jesus. Love one another as I've loved you, so shall you also love one another. Start at home, come to church. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have loved one to another. I've never had someone say to me, stop loving me. Stop. I've had people say, stop hassling me. Stop being a jerk. Yes, jerkiness comes to all of us. Whatever, stop judging me or whatever, but I've never had something where you're just, you're like, hey, listen, I'm not your judge. I'm just telling you God loves you and he sent his son for you and he wants you to turn around and get right with him. And you know, I've never had someone get upset because I've tried to love them to the truth. Tell them about the goodness of God to lead them to repentance. Well, by this you all men know that you're my disciples if you love one to another. Again, Peter's, but where are you going? Where I go now, you cannot follow, but you will follow me afterward. Peter, of course, never willing to be told no, said unto him, Lord, why can I not? Why do I have no power? Can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my suke, my soul, or my life for thy sake. I'm ready, Lord. Jesus answered, Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? Again, suke, soul. Pete, I tell you the truth. The rooster shall not sing or crow until you've denied me three times. You're going to be denying me before sunrise is even really happening. So, one of them is going to betray him. No one knows who. He's leaving, even though they've left everything, and they can't follow him, so they're on their own. And Pete's going to fumble the one-yard line with two seconds left. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. Remember, there were no chapters and verses when it was written. Let not your heart be troubled. Why would he say that? Because they're troubled. But we're out of time, so we'll have to get that next time. Let's pick it up there. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord... By our love for one another, people will tell in our marriage we believe in Christ. Hopefully our love for our children, and hopefully, Lord, as time goes on, their love for us, Lord. It's amazing. The older they get, the smarter we become. Within your church, Lord, we're very different. We've got a wide range of people here, whole different sets of backgrounds. But it's been such a joy to watch, pretty faithfully, Lord, people try to love one another. Lord, even in our failures at times, when we seek to reconcile it in a way you would be pleased, that has been a powerful witness to see people, because of the love of Christ, not be okay with a rift between them and someone else, but want to be right before you. Lord, this world is anything but lovers of one another. They are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They have teachers they desire with itching ears rather than hear sound truth. They love themselves. May we be different, Lord. May the power of God be in our lives. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that hasn't received you as their Savior, may tonight be the night they realize you are the only one who can pay for their sins. But they have to ask. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, you have told us, shall be saved. May that happen for someone who's here tonight who does not know for sure that when they leave this earth, they will be with you, as we'll learn next week, in your Father's house. Thank you that salvation is free, but it must be received. In Jesus' name, amen.